In 2014, I was fired from my job by my own kid. <laughs> you see, I was a full-time homeschooling mom, and my kid had the audacity to go off to college, leaving me effectively unemployed. At this middle-age crossroads, I had a choice. I could go back to teaching elementary school, or I could follow my dream to make a living doing what I love, improv comedy. Yes, improv, the art and craft of getting on stage without a script. I have a confession. I am in love with improv comedy. Actually, we're all friends now, right? Uh, let me just tell you the truth. I am obsessed with improv comedy. It all started at my very first improv class so when I stood around with the other students, all of us pretty much terrified as the teachers made us say stuff like bunny, 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 and zip, zap, zop, as they led us through the foundational tenets of improv comedy. Say yes and, make each other look good. There are no mistakes, only opportunities. And it's about an hour into that first class when I hear it, ah, uh, uh, the angels sing, the clouds part, and this switch is flipped in my soul. Suddenly, I'm like the cookie monster of improv comedy. Me want more improv, num, 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 more improv. Start a performing troupe, okay, num, 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 num. Write a book about improv? Sure, num, 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 num. Travel to improv festivals all around the country? Why not? Out of a job? Cookie say me could make living through improv. Num, 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 oh, hold up, buttercup. Let's get real. Making a living full time through improv is like winning the lottery, except without the money. I only know a handful of people who do it, and pretty much all of them live in big cities like Chicago, New York, and Boston, but I live in beautiful Western Massachusetts. Stunning foliage, the best people in the world. But if there was a center of the comedy universe, my little countryside outpost would be like Pluto, and then take a left. While my improv, can I make a living doing what I love? While my improv cookie monster is saying, me can do it. I'm also hearing this other internal voice getting louder and louder with messages like, I'm too old to start a new career. Who am I to think that I can do something like this? I am a fraud. I am just a mom. I'm asking for too much. I am not enough, and this voice goes on and on and on, all variations of the theme, I'm going to fail. So that's a lot of unhelpful judgment. In fact, all of those messages are coming from my internal voice of unhelpful judgment, my inner critic. I call it my evil mind meanie. That super judgy internal voice that criticizes everyone but tends to be the hardest on ourselves. If you haven't yet had the pleasure, allow me to introduce you to the internal voice of unhelpful judgment. Audience, this is the evil mind meanie. Evil mind meanie, this is the audience. Have you guys met before? <laughs> yeah. Let's be clear, there's also an internal voice of helpful judgment. That's the voice that tells you not to drive into oncoming traffic or put on pants before you leave the house. That's a good voice, listen to that voice, it's helpful. <laughs> so we have a helpful voice, we have an unhelpful voice. Why are humans built this way? Why when we're asked to do something risky or even just new is our first thought so often, I'm gonna fail instead of yippee, I'm going to rock at this. For the longest time, I couldn't figure it out. And then I imagine two people standing in the mouth of a cave during prehistoric times, and they see a saber-toothed tiger. And the first one says, ooh, danger, bad, stay away. And the other one sees the tiger and says, look, a kitty. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. What happens to that guy? Yeah, tiger tidbits. We're descendants from ooh, danger, because here, kitty, kitty is dead. This fearful voice, it's in our DNA. Can I make a living doing what I love? I feel stuck between my inner critic and my improv cookie monster. And when I'm in a pickle like this, I fall back on my improv training. 
Over the years, I've gone through exercise after exercise to practice setting aside my fear of the unknown and my fear of failure in order to focus on accepting the reality of the moment and agreeing to move forward with positivity. Acceptance and agreement, this is the heart of improvisation. Yes, this is the reality of this moment and how can I move forward with positivity? It's the spirit of yes and. Yes, it is seemingly impossible to make a living through improv in small town America. And I'm gonna try to do it anyways. On August 1st, 2014, I officially launched the perhaps excessively named Can I Make a Living Doing What I Love experiment, in which I gave myself exactly one year to make $16,000 exclusively through improv comedy. Why 16 grand? Well, first of all, it was way more than I could ever imagine making through improv at, at the time. And it also happened to be about half of my kids' annual college tuition, and my husband and I were really hoping to send our kids off into the world without overwhelming college debt. I figured that even if I didn't make my dollar goal, at least I could write a blog post about how an artist can't make even a meager living in small town America. Yes, I wrote an entire blog series about the experiment throughout that whole year. I posted regular updates on social media. I even went on the radio three times over that course of the year to talk about how the experiment was going. The whole thing was so out there, so vulnerable. And I have to admit, that vulnerability made it really scary. And when I'm scared and need to feel brave, I hold tight to a mantra given to me by a great improv teacher named Susan Messing, who said, being brave means being scared, but doing it anyway, with the result of flying. So with the experiment, I felt scared and I did it anyway, one step at a time, just like I do in an improv scene. You see, improvisers can't take the stage and create the whole show at one moment. Instead, we focus on accepting each moment as it comes and moving forward with positivity one step at a time. So with the experiment, my first step was to teach one improv class. And actually, that class ended up leading to another class, and I just kept making it up as I went along, improvising. It felt like I was building a house around myself as I was living in it. I remember at one point early on in the experiment when I had just taught those two classes, and I was absolutely convinced I had run out of people in the area interested in taking improv classes, or at least paying me for them. That was my fear talking, my inner critic. So again, I turned to improv for guidance, remembering a quote I had read from Del Close, forefather of long form improv, who advised, fall, then figure it out on the way down. Fall into the unknown. That's what improvisers are trained to do with blind trust that will just be able to work it out. So that's what I did, I fell. I offered another class, just trusting I'd work it out if nobody showed up. But actually, 12 more people showed up. Huh, go figure. While I learned a tremendous amount over the course of the Can I Make a Living Doing What I Love experiment, by far the most profound and lasting lessons were techniques for quieting the inner critic. Now, it's my understanding that this internal voice of judgment is a normal and natural part of the human experience, so we can't get it to stop completely. However, my life as an improviser has provided me with tools to quiet it down so it doesn't get in the way of manifesting our dreams. Yes, improvisation has the power to quiet the inner critic. If you don't believe me, believe science. In a study called Neural Substrates of Spontaneous Musical Performance, doctors Charles Lim and Alan Braun put jazz musicians in an fMRI, which measures blood flow of the brain, and had them play a memorized piece and then to improvise. Quite simply, they found that improvisation literally changed the blood flow of their brains, shutting down the areas involved in self-monitoring and self-criticism and lighting up the regions of the brain involved in self-creativity and, and language. So cool. Improvisation can literally change the blood flow of our brains. And they started putting uh, improvisers like me in their machine and the preliminary results are the same. So yeah, it's science, you guys. 
Improvisation provides tools to quiet the inner critic, and I'd like to share some of these tools with you today. Here's the first one. And if you only remember one thing from my talk, I hope it is this. The evil mind meanie is a lying, lying, pants on fire liar. <laughs> All of those fearful, judgmental messages that it's giving us, those are beliefs. They are not facts. So I'm beginning my experiment and I think I'm going to fail. That is a belief, not a fact. I'm a fraud. This is a belief at this moment, not a fact. I am going to humiliate myself and have to go on the radio and talk about it. A belief, not a fact, unhelpful, and at that moment, just untrue. Another technique to quiet the inner critic is to give your inner critic a name. Like, I call it the evil mind meaning, or my improv students, we call it Kelvin, which is just a random name we came up with. No offense to any Kelvins out there. I have a friend who refers to his inner critic as the parrot who lives on his shoulder. Another friend calls hers the itty bitty shitty committee. <laughs> so go ahead, give your inner critic a name. Now that it has a name, we can talk to it and say, thank you, evil mind meanie, now pipe down. We say thank you because just like this ooh danger person in the mouth of the cave with the saber-toothed tiger, our inner critic is just trying to protect us. But those are beliefs, they're not facts, they're unhelpful lies, so we say pipe down. Or when I'm feeling ornery, I'll say thank you, Kelvin, now shut up. After working with some British folks, they told me they've taken to saying, thank you, evil mind meanie, now kindly go get stuffed. <laughs> so use what works for you. I also find it helpful to swipe left on my inner critic. When my daughter was 20 years old, she let me play with the dating app on her phone. I know, I don't know if that makes me the coolest mom in the world or the mom with the worst boundaries ever, but <laughs> anyway, I learned that swipe right means that you're interested in the person and swipe left means you're not interested in the person. So since I am not interested in the evil mind meanies, lies, and unhelpful beliefs, I just swipe left on that nonsense. Can I make a living doing what I love? My first reflexive thought might be, you're going down in flames, sister. I don't have control over that first reflexive thought, but I do have some control over my second thought, which could be, that's a belief, not a fact. Thank you inner critic, now pipe down. Two months in to the experiment, I was offered a great job at well over twice my dollar goal. The catch, it wasn't improv related. Ugh. Cue my evil mind meanie who went into overtime saying stuff like, take it, take it, the money's good, you're never gonna achieve your improv dream anyways. I thanked that voice, I told it to hit the road, and then it reminded me of the envelope on our bill pile with the tuition due to my kid's fancy private college. This is when another technique for quieting the inner critic comes in handy, which I call capital C curiosity. Capital C curiosity means just asking ourselves the question, what would it be like not to listen to that voice right now? We don't have to answer the question or even follow the train of logic for it to work. I find just asking the question, what would it be like not to listen to that voice right now, helps to put us in a more positive frame of mind. So when the evil mind meanie has me convinced that there's no way we're gonna be able to afford college if I don't take that job, <laughs> I can use capital C curiosity to ask what would it be like not to listen to that voice right now? Yeah, it's kind of scary. So I feel scared and I do it anyways, trusting we'll be able to work it out as we go along. I didn't take that job. Instead, I recommitted myself to working even harder on the experiment, teaching improv classes, producing shows, performing with an amazing group of improvisers. I even branched out into applied improv, which uses improv training exercises for professional development. And you know what? Six months into the experiment, I made my dollar goal. Suddenly, I was running an improv comedy business, and that 
is when the evil mind meanie added a new hit to its playlist. <laughs> You're bad at running a business, Pam. <laughs> that was a belief, not a fact. But the truth is, I had never run a business before. My dream was to make a living doing improv. And in order to fulfill my dream, I found myself running a business. Ugh. <laughs> Talk about improvising. Oi, okay. First, uh, accept the reality of the moment. I am now running a business. And believe me, it took me many months to come into acceptance around that fact. Now, how to move forward together with positivity. This is when the final technique for quieting the inner critic that I'd like to talk about today comes in handy. Reframing. Reframing the evil mind meanies lies to more useful, positive messages. So instead of, I'm bad at running a business, I reframe it to something more positive, like, I am learning how to run a business. Or instead of, I am circling the drain of failure and everybody's watching, <laughs> I reframe it to something more positive and equally true, I'm doing the best I can and that's what I'm going to keep doing. Or even, if I'm going down, I'm going down swinging. In short, reframing involves separating the belief from the fact. So instead of focusing on what I'm afraid is going to happen, or even what I wish were happening instead, instead I focus on the more positive and equally true what is actually happening. So instead of focusing on, I just made a huge mistake, I reframe the internal message to something like, I just learned a valuable lesson. These are all techniques that I learned from improv to quiet the inner critic. Exactly one month after the official and successful ending of the experiment, I found myself signing a paper, officially founding my company, Happier Valley Comedy. And a couple years after that, things were going well enough that I was able to hire another full-time employee another improviser, an awesome, super awesome dude named Scott Braidman. And together, Scott and I opened the first and only improv theater and training program in Western Massachusetts. And my students told me I had to show you guys a picture of it. Yeah. They also, they also told me that I had to tell you, this is just two days ago, they told me I had to tell you that by manifesting our dream, now we have a place for them to manifest their dreams. What a gift. What a gift. This dream was impossible. It seemed impossible when I first started the experiment. But we are improvisers trained to set aside our ideas about what's possible or impossible, to ignore our unhelpful beliefs and fears and instead focus on accepting the reality of each moment as it comes and moving forward with positivity one step at a time as we fly or fall or just figure it out. In fact, we're all improvisers, aren't we? I don't know about you, but nobody gave me a script on the day I was born telling me how my life was going to turn out. We just figure it out as we go along, right? We feel afraid about the future, and then we do it anyways. We dream. We experiment with life. We improvise. And now, when your inner critic starts telling you about how you might fail at this or that, I hope you're able to thank your inner critic and tell it to pipe down so you can realize your dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you.